Coaches Take On Work is a community of coaches sharing our perspectives on work today. Come for the spicy takes and stay for the quick tools and tips. Find everything from best practices in management and leadership to our thoughts on trending topics in work and some fun things you may not be expecting. Some kind. Oh, NMK is your initials. Mm hmm. I'm sorry, I just put that together. Yeah. And somehow it's become a thing. Like even like, I don't know, I'm on social media. I'm not like, I don't list my full name. I just list NMK. It's become like a thing um, in a good way. So I just kind of went with it. You have a full brand now. I got, you know. Not intentionally, but it just started to happen. And I was like, okay. You love it. I did I not hate it. I can't believe I just, I, I have people who flat out call me NMK or like address me in emails as like NMK. Nice. So I just go with it. I'm like, all right. <laughs> like, Full brand identity. Love it. Uh, I do a little like back and forth at the beginning of every episode. I, don't know. I like it. I think it's silly. So this will be included. Yeah, so, you know, this will um, be all good. Oh yeah. And we'll go ahead and, and dive in for everyone listening. NMK is with me today. <laughs> we'll do a more formal introduction. <laughs> uh, but hi, everybody. I am Chelsea Side. I am the founder and chief coach at Talent Praxis and one of the founding coaches at Coaches Take On Work. We have a fun episode for you today on boundaries, but I will start by introducing my fellow um, participant today. So I have with me, I said NMK, which we'll talk about in a moment, but Natalia Martinez Kalimina. And I wanted to share a bit about Natalia's backstory. Thank you. I got the pronunciation right. <laughs> wanted to share a bit about Natalia's backstory before we get started, because I just think it's a very interesting story. And I think paints the picture of who she is for our chat today. So Natalia was born in Cuba and grew up in Havana, Moscow, and Mex Mexico City before being granted asylum in the United States. So she is an organizational psychologist and holds degrees from Harvard University and Columbia University. She works primarily at the intersection of several things, entrepreneurship, technology, economic progress, and urban development, and is deeply passionate about connecting across geographies, access gaps, and narratives of otherness. Natalia is a co-founder at um, and COO of BASE, which is a membership club that brings great minds together for curated social experiences meant to hack serendipity. And she's also the founder and principal at NMK Group, where she advises clients on economic development, human capital design, and impact strategy. So a mouthful. So many things. <laughs> I know. And I wanted to share all of that because we're discussing boundaries today. So I thought your, your full bio is important. So thank you for joining me today. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. And thank mm. you for working your way through the mouthful of an intro. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's, it's telling to the topic, right? The fact that you have a mouthful of an intro, you need to be an expert or at least, at least practicing actively at boundaries. And we're having this chat today because you and I were just having a catch-up call and you started telling me about your, I guess, what you do here. I don't know what you would call it, just your personal sort of work in setting boundaries for yourself. And I found it so inspiring. So thank you for joining yeah. and being willing to share with others. Oh my gosh, of course. It's been, for me, the topic of boundaries has been such an imperfect journey. So I just, I have to believe that it is also for other people. I'm assuming there are people out there who are just amazing at learning their boundaries and setting their boundaries and communicating their boundaries. I am not one of those people. So I find it, if it can be kind of, I find it an interesting topic to engage with and I hopefully useful for other people who are also trying to figure that out because it's not a very linear, at least for me, it has not been a very linear process. We can learn so much more from that, I think, than people who just do it innately. So thank you for sharing your journey. Oh, absolutely. Journey. Yeah. <laughs> the struggle. The, the yeah, the struggle. <laughs> like, I didn't know we wanted to use that word. Uh, well, let's yeah. start. <laughs> I like to define terms just so we're all talking about the same thing. So for you, what are boundaries and, and how do they apply to your life? Yeah. So, I mean, to me, boundaries, and I heard this, I'm going to butcher this, but I, the way that I've heard it described that I really, that resonates with me is some version of kind of the space, kind of a, creating a space and a dynamic in that it works for me and it works for you, right? Like it's what allows it to, it's what allows me to show up authentically and fully 
and consistently and at my, maybe not like my best every time, but it's what allows me to show up well in a consistent and kind of non-resentful manner. Like, I think for me, the big trigger point around boundaries is if I'm showing up, but I don't feel well and feel well can mean any number of things, right? From like, I'm overstretched, I am resentful, I am irritable, I am unhappy, I am checked out, I'm not present, right? Like it can look like many things on like a gamut of like moderately probably annoyed to like very resentful, uh, but it's a, but it's all, it's colors of not great. Right. So I think boundaries are what allows me to show up not like that and to show up consistently not like that. Even in your definition, it just feels different to me than how we normally talk about them. So I love that. Thank you. What allows you to show up well? And also, I like the immediate self love. Okay. Maybe not my best. That's okay. <laughs> it just allows me to show yeah, up. Yeah. Well. I mean, exactly. It doesn't even need to, it needs, it's like I always, <laughs> I try to have like an 80, 20 rule for most things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think about that even in the context of, I'll give you kind of a, a silly example, but I think also loops back into boundaries where like, if I'm trying to make a decision around something, I will double check my motive because I think, so like the, the difference between logic and motive, like there are many times where the logic of something will make sense. And if we just went on the logic of like, well, should I do this? Does it make sense in the larger goals that I have or in the larger context of what I'm hoping for? Um, you know, does, does it make sense? Yes, or sometimes it's a binary, but like, yes, it does make sense, I should proceed. Like on logic alone, something makes sense. But when you look, dig a little deeper and you look at the motive, you start to encounter other things. And so like looking at motive is very helpful to me in, in figuring out, should I be doing something? Should I be saying yes to something? Do I wanna go after this? Do I not? Do I wanna commit to this? Like what's leading me to feeling a particular way? Cause you can show up at the same thing from very different motives. Mm -hmm. and so like my motive and a breakdown is like an 80, 20 rule where like, I assume that because we're human, there's always a 20%, like a 15 to 20% that is like, maybe not the best motive, right? It's something self-serving or it's something ego-driven or it's, it's something like, it's not like purely magical, positive intent. But as long to me, as long as there's like an 80% that is a well-motivated intent, then I'm okay proceeding. When I don't proceed, it's if that like 15, 20 is much bigger. Like I'm like, I'm just, I want to do this up thing because I just, I'm being really selfish about it. And this is how I want to do it. <laughs> like I want to feed my ego. I'm like, well, I should probably not do it. <laughs> so like it's, it's helpful to make decisions, but also it's very helpful for setting boundaries because if I double check my motive around certain things, you can uncover stuff that doesn't feel as great faster. I love that. So this so will kind of go together. And I know you mentioned you had a journey in your, your boundary setting, but if you could give us a little bit of a history in a nutshell, how did you kind of get to where you are today and how you set boundaries? Yeah. Well, so I would say I didn't set boundaries. That's the first chapter one, no boundaries <laughs> is how I would call that. Uh, there were no boundaries of any kind. I, I generally, I allowed both personally and professionally for other people's priorities, other people's needs, um, real demands, illusory demands, narratives in my mind, like all of these things took precedence over what I needed or what allowed for things to be consistently feel good for me. So I was constantly overstretched. I was constantly people pleasing. I was abs I was full of resentments of different shapes and sizes because I was allowing people to maneuver, you know, everything from my calendar and how people inserted themselves into my calendar, both socially and professionally, to expectations of how and what I was doing and to what degree. So I would say chapter one was really no boundaries, but generally unaware that I unaware that this was not a good way to be. And then I happened to cross, and I remember you and I talked about this briefly, but I happened to cross like something, I kept coming across some mentions and boundaries. And like, I love this phrasing of the teacher, like the teacher appears when the student is ready. And so I'm sure I had come across many instances of mentions of boundaries before, and I had just breezed right by them. But something about this particular moment, and this was a couple, a handful of years ago, I was like, this is interesting. I don't, I don't know if I know enough about this. And so I like, search for a random podcast on boundaries and started listening to it. 
And it was extremely telling to me that this was something I needed to look into because I was having such a strong negative reaction to people setting boundaries. But like all of the examples on this podcast were people who were learning how to make boundaries and were, were successfully setting boundaries, right? So they would give an example of, well, this situation happened and that didn't work for me. And so what I said was blah, 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 like setting a boundary. And my reactions were, I'm not exaggerating, viscerally judgmental. Like I was like, this person is like, why can't you just get it together? Why can't you just do these things? I don't, I mean, it was not a very logical reaction, but it was so, so negative that I was like, oh, this is fascinating because I am so judging these people because I clearly <laughs> am unable to do this. Like it's one of those like mirror moments that can be so powerful where if you're lucky enough to catch that it's a mirror, it can be really expansive. And so I think that's what happened to me where I realized myself being so incredibly judgmental of people that were setting boundaries. And I was lucky enough to have that moment like coincide with this mirroring of realizing, oh, that's because I'm kind of jealous that you're doing this and I don't do this. And so, and I don't know how to do it. And it's wild to me that you would even think that this is an appropriate thing to do. And it shows me the gap of where I am versus where perhaps like well-adjusted people <laughs> around boundaries are. <laughs> so, and it's never fun to notice, to like realize that you're not well-adjusted around a topic. So I think that was a big marker for me. And then from there, I just started like slowly building in, like noticing, I would say noticing, that's probably what happened next, noticing all of these areas where I was like, oh, I can answer this differently. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm irritated that this has happened, but really I've allowed it to happen. So what is my part of this, this, this quote boundary being breached? Oh, because there wasn't a boundary in the first place. And so noticing, I started to notice a lot more of these things and to understand retroactively situations in my life where I wasn't at my best or was building a resentment around something or kind of, and realizing the relationship between that and boundaries. And so from there, I started to work a lot more actively on doing them. And it's still very, very much an area of progress. I think it will be probably for a very long time, but it's, it's a muscle that requires a lot of building. And that's been kind of the narrative arc. Awesome. So it sounds like for people listening, starting with awareness. And so if you're listening to this, because you already have that self-awareness, that boundaries are something you're working on, or maybe, maybe Natalia is your mirror today and you think what she's sharing is bogus, perhaps reflect on that and, and consider why. So I think that's super interesting yeah. and just awareness that you're not showing up well, awareness that things could be better. And then you mentioned awareness of your role. Did I even set a boundary to begin with? What's my role in this breach? I think that's awesome. And we discussed- Yeah, that has been, I will- yes. Oh, just to double click quickly on that. I will Please. say that has been a really- I feel like that's a really empowering question to ask mm -hmm. because we know it's not pleasant to be reminded of this, but we know how little control we have other people over other people's actions. Um, and reality is complicated, right? Like other people also have their daily struggles, their, their bad days, their own respective things that affect, you know, how they show up at their best or not. And we, not only do we not have control over that, but we often don't have a lot of visibility into it. So mm -hmm. the only thing <laughs> we can, that we can control is what we put out there as what's important to us and how we are best supported in showing up well. And so I think it can feel sometimes, it can feel disorienting to realize, to kind of turn that camera inwards and not just blame other people for, you know, spilling out all over the in ways that we wouldn't want them to. So it can feel very disorienting, but I think past the disorientation is a place of empowerment because you have a lot more control over that, right? Like you can choose how you explain that to people, how you, how you step out or into situations. And that, that can feel, I think, great, especially when you do it well, like it's such a feeling of like victory where you're like, yes, Mm -hmm. I, yes. Like when you set a boundary and you haven't been setting boundaries and you catch yourself doing it, you're like, this is magical. I did it. <laughs> so it, it can feel like such a win. Yep. And you said based on what's important to us, which is a perfect tip off for me for the next question. And you and I discussed values and sort of basing your boundaries and values. What are values? How do you even go about defining what's important to you? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think it's a really interesting topic because I think most of us go through life 
kind of not really sitting down to define what are the valuables that are value, not valuables, values that are most important to us. And I think like digging into, digging beyond the surface, right? So because there's things that I think on paper, everyone's like, well, yes, of course, like I believe in compassion or or like curiosity or whatever, right? That's like a general life way. But I think digging into actually being accountable for what are the, th- what are the values that we feel so strongly about that they are guideposts, like accountability guideposts for how we make choices and how we communicate those choices. And to me, the like the tricky part about values is that they're not this like fluffy, nice, feel good thing. They are a tool for decision making. Hmm. And the, the benefit of that is that I think we can use them to help us make decisions that require trade-offs, to help us make decisions that are uncomfortable, right? Like they can be, but they're a tool. They're not this like magical, um, like soft, fluffy place. And so the example, the example, I know know you and I had talked about this, but the example that made it really stark for me was I am a person. So like, I absolutely am a person who like, I'm generally tardy to things. This is like a thing that it happens. I try to be on time. I am overly optimistic about my day. I'm not trying to be disrespectful of people, of other people, but I absolutely, I'm very tardy often. And it's improved over the years, but it's like, it's a thing. And I was feeling such stress about it because I don't want to be disrespectful. I don't want to make anybody feel disrespected. I, I, I don't want to pe- people to walk away with that experience feeling like I didn't value their time, especially because that's not my underlying motivation. Um, and so I felt really guilty and stressed. And then I would like over communicate about them. It was just like, not a great, not the best setup. And what I kind of had some clarity around what are the values that are important to me? And it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to be honest that timeliness apparently is not a value that I, ha- <laughs> that I, it's not like, let's just be clear. Timeliness, punctuality is not a value that I strong, strongly hold near and dear to my heart. But what is a, what are values that I hold near and dear to my house at heart? Like, why am I stressed here? Right. And I'm like, well, I'm stressed because I don't want people. I think respect is, is a core value. I think people feeling valued and seen is a really big value for me. And I'm afraid that being late is contributing to people and feeling these things that I do feel very strongly about hope people not feeling. So I was like, okay, so there are other ways for me to solve for that, right? Like I can communicate very differently. I can give people a heads up. I can be like highly proactive in terms of being like, hey, I I realize you know, you and I have a lunch today at 1230. I have a meeting right before. So if it runs a little bit late, I'm expecting that I'll be 10 to 15 minutes late. I can text you this in the morning. I can text you this the night before. I can like accommodate for you not feeling disrespected or not thought of or, you know, like that your time isn't valued in other ways that do align with my core values Mm -hmm. and, and accept the fact that, I mean, ideally I'm not late, I'm late less and less, but also I know there's a percentage of times that I'm not really late. And this is just, it's kind of who I am. So I'm going to accept that this is a thing that I do while I try to improve it, but also trying to account for people's experience on the other side of it, feeling more aligned with my values. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, that's it's kind of a messy and imperfect example because ideally I would never be late, but that's not really life. And so how do I accommodate for that in a way that's a little bit better? So that's that's how I think values play into it. Yeah. I love and can that. be a tool. So and you go from values to and you kind of gave it in your example of even setting and communicating those boundaries, but could you share more about sort of the stages of sharing boundaries, what that looks like for you? Yeah. I mean, I think, so having boundaries, I think realizing that realizing what is important to you, realizing kind of the value al- alignment, realizing what are boundaries that feel important to you. And then al- and like having some additional clarity on that is an ever evolving process, but is a super important one. So to me, like that is the foundation of it. Realizing, cause you can feel like people, different people have diff- very different types of boundaries. And so like someone may be offended or feel encroached in one circumstance and not another and vice versa. And so kind of figuring out what the things that are really important to you are, I think is step one. For me, the steps after that are kind of figuring out how to best communicate that, right? Um, and 
communicate it after the fact as a point of feedback, communicating it before the fact is a thing that like, well, this is what I need. And it's important to me that this happens so that I don't build a resentment. So like figuring out how and when we're communicating our boundaries, I think mm -hmm. is another kind of thing. And there's no right answer to that. There are circumstances where if you can preempt it, that's amazing. There's some circumstances where it's later. And then I think there's a lot of nuance. It's like the ever evolving lesson of what is the best form of holding, communicating, reacting to our own boundaries. And the, the example that comes to mind for me is this kind of very helpful distinction that I've made, which has sometimes been so uncomfortable between telling a truth versus telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think about this because I realize that very often I, I'm assuming other people as well listening, but I tell a truth, but not the truth because it's so much more comfortable. And the result is that sure, you can kind of accommodate for that particular instance, but the result is that you haven't actually upheld your boundary in a larger sense because the other person doesn't have an, like, they don't know not to do that again because they haven't actually gotten proper feedback. So the example I have is, um, and some of my friends if they ever listen to this podcast will chuckle because they've been on the receiving end of this is that I just don't like, I don't like baby showers. I don't like bridal showers. I just, I'm like not into showers. It's like a random, it's, there are other reasons for that, but I don't like it. But for a long time, I felt obliged to go. And so when I didn't want to go, I would say a truth, but not the truth. Right. So I would say, you know, oh my gosh, like I have another commitment that day, or I'm really busy. I can't make it, or I'm going to be out of town all of which were true, but they were not the reason why I wasn't going. And so then I started, which was so uncomfortable, I started pivoting into this place of, hey, I got your invite to your baby shower. So excited for you. And I love you so dearly. As you know, I just don't really like baby showers. I don't feel comfortable. I don't enjoy them. I just, I don't ascribe to this format. I super support you doing it, but I just, I personally don't connect with this format of like celebrating imminent parenthood for various reasons. And so I'm going to, I'm going to sit this one out. I just wanted to give you a heads up before our RSVP because I will be RSVPing no. And so actually telling people the real reason is really freeing because they can, choose. first of all, like they can choose how to respond to that. Your, their choice is not your, your responsibility, but they now actually have real information about you. So next time they may have a baby shower, they will know that it's not a thing that you love or that you will be likely to attend. And so you're showing up much more transparently to your relationships in a way that's useful for you and the other, and the people on the other side, but it, it can be very uncomfortable. I a truth versus the truth is <laughs> was the most groundbreaking thing when you first shared it with me. So for anyone listening, I want to just call back to some of the things Natalia just shared. So you have your own process for this. First, she talked about, you know, defining what is important to you. So if you've already had the mirror experience, if you are ready to start setting boundaries differently, do you have a clear list of what's important to you? you have this values alignment with these guideposts and tools, not just that fuzzy zone, um, and then to start setting the boundaries. And so think about where you are in that process. You know, for me personally, I already had the values that I felt very aligned to. I even had the boundaries and there was still something always off in, in my boundary setting. And I didn't know what it was until I heard a truth versus the truth. And I realized I have never shared the truth. <laughs> I've always shared a truth. So the professional example I'll give, I was in a meeting where I was doing a volunteer leadership position I didn't want to do anymore. And I shared, I didn't want to do it. And I said, I just, I don't have time for this anymore. And I caught myself and Natalia's voice came in my mind. And I was like, that's not the truth. And so I said, actually, I'm sorry. That's a lie. I could make time for this. I don't want to prioritize this anymore. It is no longer one of my priorities for various reasons. Again, and I didn't even go into detail on those. The truth is just, I can make time for anything I want. I don't want to make time for this anymore. And everyone in the room right. was like, thank you for sharing. You know, really appreciate the honesty. And I had so many people messaging me afterwards. I've never seen you that vulnerable in a leadership setting before. And I was like, wow, groundbreaking. And all I did was share yeah. the truth for maybe the first Correct. time. So, And right. I've had the same set of experiences where it can be so, it can be so uncomfortable in some moments but it can actually, but it can be such a place of 
connection because I think people can tell, not that people can tell that you're not being fully honest because I, again, you're, you're telling them something that is truthful, but I think the energy in the room shifts when you actually just say the thing that is actually fully true, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm not interested in this. I don't, I don't, you know, it's like, it's the equivalent, it's the dating equivalent, right? Where it's very different when you tell somebody like, I'm not interested in dating you versus I just need some time to like figure some things out because I'm not sure where I'm landing, right? Like we've, we've all been on the receiving and the giving end of those types of conversations around dating or friendships. And it's not that you feel that someone is telling you something dishonest, but it feels much more, I think, soothing and yeah. calming to like the nervous system to feel, to feel that you're receiving the truth. Yep. Absolutely. Well, you know, I thank you so much for joining and, and sharing your anecdotes and also sharing your process. So for anyone listening, I'll put this in the notes as well. So check them out, but try to start by defining what's important to you, work on some values alignment, define your boundaries. And if you've already done all three of those, like me, try to practice sharing the truth. It is harder than it sounds in real life. It's harder than it sounds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Natalia, if people want to follow along your journey or, or stay in touch with you, how do you recommend they do? Um, I would say they can find me on LinkedIn. That's an easy one as well. Natalia Martinez Kalinina, or I I'm on Twitter, but I interact very little on Twitter. Uh, soul afloat on Instagram. I'm a lot more active also soul afloat. Um, but yeah, happy to stay in touch with folks who may be interested. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time today. And I hope you all enjoy and find your truth. Yeah. There we go. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to Coaches Take On Work for your favorite streaming service so you don't miss a future episode. We are Coaches Take On Work. And for this episode's hot take. But I happened to cross like something, I kept coming across some mentions and boundaries. And like, I love this phrasing of the teacher, like the teacher appears when the student is ready. And so I'm sure I had come across many instances of mentions of boundaries before, and I had just breezed right by them. But something about this particular moment, and this was a couple, a handful of years ago, I was like, this is interesting. I don't, I don't know if I know enough about this. And so I like searched for a random podcast on boundaries and started listening to it. And it was extremely telling to me that this was something I needed to look into because I was having such a strong negative reaction to people setting boundaries. But like all of the examples on this podcast were people who were learning how to make boundaries and were, were successfully setting boundaries, right? Okay.